I guess we should get started because we're already behind schedule, so that's great. Uh, can can fail from start. Um, my name is Mort Ronge. As I said, I come from Ericsson, uh, currently at work in Ericsson, where I don't do any .NET development at all. I write mostly C++ or, and some Java and some Ruby sometimes. Um, but I've been on a .NET developer for many years before that. I started with .NET in 2002 with the first betas of uh, Visual Studio. I was quite excited about the, this new technology. And these days, um, so to get some .NET in love in my life, I do some F# -sharp contributions to the compiler, sort of new, you know, so see, so still keep my skills uh, up to date. But today it will not be about F# -sharp. it will instead be about Visual Studio and C# -sharp. Um, and today it's all about oh, pragmatic meta programming. So I don't know what you thought you want to get, you're going to get when you read this title. I'm not, sure, and I'm, I'm very curious to see if you. If you get what you thought you want to get, if you get you what you wanted, or if you get what you needed, or if you didn't get something at all out of this. But I I'm sure when you fill out this, uh, this red, um, red, green, and uh, yellow one, I'm going to find out either way. So today is all about uh, do not repeat yourself. And when we talk about that in the context of computer language, computer, computer programming, that means that we should avoid writing redundant code. Because redundant code, uh, I think, in a growing code base, re repetitive code is a slow death of a project. It's not so bad if it's just it's, it's stable, but if it keeps growing, sooner or later the whole project might sort of you know uh, suffocate from its own code base. So we want to avoid that. And in, in C Sharp, we have great tools actually to avoid writing redundant code. For instance, uh, a for loop. So instead of writing code like this, we can write a code like this. A for loop. So now you're thinking, I didn't come to Svetug to learn about for loops, I'm way beyond that, and I know you are, but let's start simple here. Uh, another great way to sort of avoid redundancy in code is that we have a pattern here which is being repeated, and we make a function of it. Once again, brain dead, everybody knows about this. Um, but sometimes when I write code, I get stuck into situations where I feel like I'm, I'm, I'm repeating myself, but I don't know what to do about it. For instance, an exception clause. So this is a guy who has been writing this on a, on a blog saying this is the correct way to write an exception class in C-sharp. And I, I cut away all the code, I cut away all the comments, but it turns out it's like 70 lines of code that I don't care about because of what I really cared about was the name of the exception and the type of the or, or what it inherits. Everything else here is just fluff, redundant in my opinion, which I have to maintain. And well, as an F-sharp developer, I know the answer, of course. We just switch to F-sharp, which has a nicer syntax to declare exceptions, right? But not even if I was working as a, in .NET world, and if I was working in a C-sharp team, I wouldn't switch to F-sharp just because of this. And there are other issues with my programming where we still are repeating ourselves, and F-sharp doesn't really help. When I was programmer, C-sharp programmer and .NET programmer, um, this model view MVVM pattern was all the rage. So we wrote a lot of view models. And the basic idea is here that we implement this I note where property changed, and whenever this property, my property is changed, uh, we raise this property. And we do this for all our uh, view model properties. What I really cared about, though, in all this code, was the type of the property and the name of the property. The rest here is just fluff. It's redundant. I don't want to maintain this, but I have to. And a final example. Um, I'm sure you've seen this. Uh, we have a custom class, and I have a read custom at reads from data reader, and I read this ID, first name, last name, and so on and so on. Obviously, I also need a right one that comes with right custom as well. Once again, I have some kind of redundancy of information here, because this ID here, it's down here, and this long here is sort of here as well, and back and forth. So whenever I change the type here, I have to make sure to change it here. If I add something new here, I have to add it here, and in the write function, and somewhere else. This kind of code is redundant, and it leads to all kind of pain. What I really cared about was the name of the sort of, you know, my class, customer, and the types and the names of the properties. And r the rest is just redundant. I don't think it's com completely controversial to say, although this presentation might get a little bit controversial, to say that code application increases the maintenance cost. It's just more code to write. But the biggest, biggest thing, really, is when we are maintaining it, we might need to because we're duplicating information, when I change it in one place, I have to find all the other places and change that as well. And that can be tricky to find. And that all can give tricky bugs. So we want to avoid code application. So we start looking for answers. And we are sort of engineers. 
we, we start digging for answers and we f find things like reflection. So let's think about this customer, uh, from reading from database to a customer. We can use reflection to ask a class or ask an object of all the fields and we write a generic loop that loop over all the fields and sort of put them into a class or write them back to the database correctly. And then we find out this is very slow. So we start doing a lot of caching. We start writing a lot of link expression trees. We might even start dabbling into dynamic IL just to get the performance. So we start adding complexity. I think one of the major sources of complexity in software, well, the first, the biggest source of adding complexity in software is that we don't know what we're doing and we sort of cover it up with complexity. Uh, the second source of complexity is when we must also sort of, you know, avoid writing redundant code. And I can say I've sinned a lot on this. So, but the problem with that, when we start writing this reflection-based code, is that now we're starting trading compile time errors for runtime errors. Things that were known in compile time now turn out turn up as runtime errors. I think that's a sub-optimization. And because of that, because the compiler can't hel help us, we have to sort of increase our test coverage. And it can be hard to write a good test coverage for this kind of generic algorithm. And it can be hard to understand. I'm going to show you an example now. And this is not a stab at this uh, great product, which is called Dapper, because it's really good. It's solving this problem. It, it, it's really good. But this kind of code is not easy. Defining a dynamic method and then injecting a lot of IL code, what, what is this? Most C-Shop developers, most Net developers don't know this. A few, 1%, maybe the, the killers Joan was talking about, I'm not sure. Uh, the problem is code, when this thing here doesn't work, it's not going to blow up here, because we're defining a dynamic method, it's going to blow up in that method. And then we get the error message saying, invalid uh, IL code detected in unknown function in unknown module. Can imagine how fun that is to debug, because there's no source code. It's just dynamic. It exists just at runtime. This kind of code, though, which I spent a lot of time sort of criticizing, everyone can understand this code. And it pro if it blows up here, yeah, maybe it's not a string anymore. Maybe it's something else. Maybe this is not a long. It's maybe an int. This is, on the other hand, quite easy to understand and fix. So that makes it sort of, you know, risk because the code gets more complex. It also gets more risky to change. But it's also limited. Because all this complexity just solved the mapping from a database into a class problem, or object problem. What about my exception problem? What about my view model problem? This doesn't help. So adding complex code also increases maintenance cost. So having duplicated code increases maintenance cost, complex code increases maintenance cost. And I, I will just tell you a short story from my life where I really felt this. Because I was, uh, this is in 98, I think. I was working at a company doing map engines. And I had read a very good book by Andre Alcindesco, who's a very smart guy, about modern C design. And basically, he said that we should sort of prefer compile time errors to work towards runtime errors. We should do all these kind of nice tricks with the C compiler, which are very obscure, to sort of get it to generate compile time optima optimal code. I wrote this component. It did very well, it did the job. It has few bugs because I fixed the compile time errors. It was quite effective. I know this was a little bit strange, so I put actually quite much effort into documenting this. And then I went back, and then I went on vacation for four weeks. When I came back, my team had thrown away all my code and replaced it with their own, which was more code, uh, less efficient, and more buggy. So then I, I asked uh, these guys, why are you doing this? Why, why didn't you just, you know, uh, they needed some key features. Okay, why didn't you just update my code base? And they said, well, we couldn't get it to compile. And I tried to tell them, this is a feature. You ca can't get it to compile. You're trying to add something buggy. It doesn't compile. This is good. But they said then, we couldn't get it comp to compile at all. We couldn't work with this code base. <laughs> to me, this felt very awkward. Because on one hand, I want to be able to sort of, you know, write writing duplicated code or uh, redundant code. On the other hand, I don't want my teammates to hate me. And what good is a book that no one can read, if I write a book that no one can read? Or if I write a scientific theory which explains something but nobody understands the explanation? What good is writing code that can't be maintained? It would be very easy for me to say I'm surrounded by idiots. But they weren't idiots. They were smart guys. They couldn't work with my code. So for many years I was in kind of this state, feeling quite awkward and trying to figure out you know, how can I sort of write good code, non-duplicated, non and still be, you know, be invited for lunch? And it took a couple of years, and then in 2008, a friend of mine introduced me to something which uh, sort of transformed my way of thinking about programming and how 
to write programs. And that's kind of, you know, suddenly made the sun rise a little bit. It's starting to look a little bit better. So when we're really looking for answers, I think, when we really are looking for answers, we should look for something that's powerful, that can solve a big class of problems. Not just this mapping from a database to, uh, to, to an object problem. No, the exception problem. Or uh, the view model problem. Or something else I can't imagine at this point in time. And we should have a simple concept, right? Anyone can understand. Even my mother. Maybe not my mother, though. Because I gave her an iPad a couple of years ago, and she recently figured out that it can take photos. So maybe not her, right? But everybody else. And I wanted to be language agnostic, because I work with many languages. I work with C++, I work with Java, I work with C Sharp, I work with F Sharp. I want something which I can use and apply in all these situations. And sometimes I need to write code that communicates from C Sharp to C++. And I need sort of redundant code on both sides. How can I solve that with one sort of tool, one way to do it? And I want an access strategy, and I want it to be lightweight. And I'm going to bring that up later. So at up to this point, presentation, I feel pretty good, right? So I think I might make a little bit sense. Now I'm a little bit more concerned, almost scared, because I'm going to bring up something which is controversial to many people, which is a tool called T4, which is shipped with Visual Studio. And my friend who introduced me to this tool, he thought this is a DSL writing tool to write domain-specific languages. It's not. It's a code generation tool, which is a bad word. I know it's controversial, right? But I don't understand it, because for me, it's a tool that's helped me. And maybe the point of this presentation is sort of to make sense of this tool. But I don't like to call it a code generation tool. I prefer to call it a meta programming tool. Because a code generation tool in my head is something you put data into one end, and then it sort of rolls around a little bit. And then in the end, you get code out. And if you don't like the code, well, nothing you can do about it. You're, you're a victim of, of the tool. But with a tool like T4 and others I will not talk about, this sort of the principle how it works, you're a programmer all the way. If you don't like the code it outputs, it's up to you to fix it. You can make it sort of, you know, work your way. So let's look at the stupid redundant program, which nobody would have in production code, I hope, at least. But it's simple to start with and sort of can help us sort of, sort of you know, understand uh, maybe the when we get a little bit more complicated. So this code has some kind of redundancy in it. This public int x is sort of repeated and this equal sign is repeated. We want to write a for loop. But how do you write a for loop inside C, C Sharp? Now, C Sharp doesn't support metaprogramming in that sense. Ruby does. But we, we're not in Ruby. We're on C Sharp land. So we use T4, which is a metaprogramming tool, which means we write a program that writes a program. That can look like this. This part here is just injected into output stream. Here we say, please repeat the next line 10 times and inject this item variable here so we have an incrementing number. And it produces this code. Now, you might think you recognize this, because it looks an awful lot like ASP. ASP. You might have heard about that. And PHP. It's because it is. But instead of generating HTML, we generate code. But the thing is, T4 doesn't look at this as a C Sharp code. This can be XML. This can be C++. It can be F Sharp. It can be poetry. I don't know which girl or boy you like that prefer like to have T for generated poetry, but if you know one, keep it, keep him or her. That would be great, uh, fiancé. And up here we have normal C sharp code, and it, that's important because we can open databases, we can read XML schemas, and sort of generate code depending on that. But for people that haven't used this one, I want to show you a little bit of demo and stop, st maybe stop talking a little bit. So I'm. Um, uh, does this work? Oh, well I have pretty big fonts anyway. Um, a good sign of a good project is if you can use the dark mode in Visual Studio, which is important to me. Um, so I have normal Visual Studio product. Oh, I have mouse here. Um, and I'm going to add a new file. And you see it says CS down here. I'm going to type test. Dot c but not instead of CS, I'm going to type TT, which stands for text template. And this works in normal Visual Studio. Hopefully it works in this demo as well. Um, uh, prepare, prepare, switch between back and forth. We get two files, a test TT and test CS. This is sort of the meta program T4 file. This is sort of the generator file. Uh, okay, I'm going to remove that. Currently they are identical. This is the T4 file. 
and when I save it, it's compiled and generated, and it's, it's the same thing, really. But we want to add logic. We want to generate this redundant code now. So I'm going to add a for loop. And now, unfortunately, uh, I'm going to do something very risky. And that is talking while I program. Uh, but unfortunately, uh, Studio doesn't have IntelliSense for um, T4. So I have installed a plugin, which I can recommend if you're starting out, which is called uh, Tangible Engineering. Uh, T4 pl T4 plugin. It's available on. It's there. Is they, ha they have a free charge one, which is what, what I'm using. Otherwise, you basically just have a, a plain text file. And I save this, and I get, you know, silly ten ten lines. Test. Then we want to make this a public int x. And we get ten fields. We, uh, but it, it's not valid C# -sharp code because we can't have ten fields with the same name. So we inject this variable, uh, either. and we have now it's valid C# -sharp code hopefully. And then your boss asks you, "I want a hundred of these." I don't know why he would ask you, but if you ask for hundred, you can give him two hundred because you, that's how productive you are. Uh, and uh, and you have a lot of lot of these. There you are. And then uh, just to spite you, he says, well, they should be properties, right? And uh, then you say, no problem. Let's make proper property out of it. And it's property. And if it's about need a backing property, it's not a problem. And, I and if it's a need to be a view model proper property, it's not a problem. So this code here, now, important to remember here, I'm going to talk more about that. This code here is still redundant. This is still redundant, but we are not going to maintain that. This is what's getting compiled. This is what we can execute it. This is what we're going to debug. What we, depa what we are maintaining is this program here, which is basically ASP PHP. But I don't want to waste too much time talking about this simple example. So let's go on. Uh, and get into the more interesting example. But basically, that's how we get started. You add a new file test.tt, you get two files. One is with the T4 file and one is the CS file. And then you install the Tenable Engineer plugin and it's a little bit easier on you. So T4 has been with us since uh, Visual Studio 2005. So some might think of this as sort of old and uh, boring technology. I tend to think of it as an old and reliable. And even Meta program has been with us in a very long time. And here I think we might have the inventor, at least that's what Wikipedia says, of Meta programming. And it's this woman here, you can't tell it here, but uh, her name is Betty Holberton, and she invented a merge sort generator algorithm in 1951, which is the earliest sort of reference I found to a program that writes a program. Given some inputs, it generated optimal merge sort algorithm. So it's been with us since for 60, uh, 60 years, and uh, and T4 has been with us since, two, uh, since 2005, but obviously before that we had CodeSmith and other things. There's nothing new. But let's talk about the more relevant example. I'm not sure how many of you are doing view models these days, but try to map it to a similar sort of problem, maybe. This view model thing here contains redundancy. And some might say, well, this is solved now in .NET 4.5. We don't have any problems here anymore because this is in .NET 4. The issue here, this is fragile code. We have to sort of repeat this information here in uh, two places. So obviously it's because I haven't programmed for a long time. I don't know about all the new uh, features in .NET 4.5, like call a member name, uh, where we don't need to have that one. But I still claim that this is redundant. There's too much fluff here, because I just care about the type of the property and the name of the property. Everything else is just a consequence of that. This is just fluff, which I don't want to maintain. So let's look at a simple uh, generating view model classes um, uh, example here. <coughs> and now I'm going to navigate through the correct project here. My demo is here too, view model. So let's take a look at our view model and pretend it's not generated. So we have the ID property, which looks like this. And then we have the creator property, which looks like this. And we have the first name property, which looks like this. We see a structure. We see something which is redundant. And it goes on like that. I don't like maintaining this. 
So if you would like to make a new property called uh, I'm at uh, is at Svetug property, what we typically would do if we wouldn't generate it, we take this code here and then we. I, I'm still ready. I'm already getting bored by this, by the way. Uh, I'm very easily bored programmer. Maybe not so, not so lazy, but I'm very easily bored instead. That's uh, so I'm going to replace this thing. You get the point, right? And I might um, need to make this a boolean, and I go through all of these and I update them. Boring, uninteresting coding. Instead, oops, I'm wrong file here. Back here, I defined what I call the model, which describes what I want to have generated. I want to have a customer view model, which has an ID property and a creative property. And now, when adding a Svetug ID property, for some reason, I don't know why I have it, but let's add it. I save it, and let's check the generated view model here now. This is what's going to get gonna going to get compiled, and I find this Svetug ID here. And just for fun, we can sort of search how many places this is used. And let's see now. Oh boy. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, uh, fifteen places pr approximately. And we found a place we didn't know about before. But apparently, we needed to put in this in the pretty print function, which got automatically generated for us now. We didn't have to care about this. So we mentioned Svetug ID property in like fifteen places. That's redundancy, information redundancy. So that makes it easier for us to add new uh, uh, new properties to our model. Some might say now, well, code snippets does that for us. We don't need this. But there is a crucial difference here between this and code snippets, where I would say that code snippet, snippets, and I don't want to make enemies, but I think that's the Sif side of programming, and metaprogramming is the Jedi side of programming. And uh, code snippets gives fast results, but might lead to anger, uh, things like that. So the problem is that if we want to sort of refactor here, so we make a simple refactoring here now, this is not so bad, but you get the point. So I inherit this I notify property change up here. And and the pretty print function. And I say I want to use my oops, there it goes. It's always dangerous to program live. Yep, very dangerous. Can I hit the right button? I want to in inherit the base view model. And when inheriting the base view model, I need to do some updates of the code. So I have to scroll down to the end here. Go on, go on, go on. And down here, I have then to remove these things here, like that. And then I need to go up here again. And I have to make this a protected uh, on print value. Let's see if that compiles. Protect the void. Uh, OK, override as well. And now we just do this for every view model class we have in our product, which can be many or few. We have to sort of apply it. Or we change our view when we're in our T4 view. So we just change the code in one place and then generate it. So here we have um, uh, sort of the view. I like to call it, the here's the model describing what we want to have generated. The view describes how the model should be transformed into code. And it's just a simple for loop for each class definition uh, inject this code and so on and so on. And we said we want to sort of replace this with, with base view model like that. And then we scroll down and we want to remove this thing here because we no longer need them. And if I remember correctly, it should be override on print value and also protected. Save. Hopefully it works. And we go up again and we check the code. Yes, it says base view model. Let's see where it says view model apart from that. So next, an article, an order, an order row. All have the right one. We have now refactored all our instances of our view model classes. Not so many in this case, but it can be a lot. And especially when we need to refactor sort of the property implementations where we want to sort of make, make changes to these kind of things. You, we make the change in one place, and it spreads throughout our code base. We, we ha we, this code is redundant, but what we maintain is not redundant. 
I'm going to check the time. Hopefully I don't panic too much. Ten five minutes. Yep, it's bad, but uh, I <laughs> but uh, I claimed uh, that uh, we well, we got a little bit delayed. Anyway, so a challenge though I want to bring up here is that well, some might say, what about if I want to make changes to to the generator code, and here for some reason I want to inject some business logic. What happens when the code is regenerated by T4 next time I save it? It's gone. T4 makes no attempt to save it. I think this is a feature. We should constantly regenerate it. We should not put the business logic inside the generated scaffolding because I think this is scaffold. But we obviously need to extend the view model with business logic in some sense. But as a great guy I worked with once, he was also very unpleasant, but he was a great guy in many ways. He said that the, uh, the view model, uh, the, um, the business logic is, logic is the uh, except exception to the model. So that contains what we can't fit into the model. So we need to resist, uh, um, we need to resist chaining this code. But how can we inject behavior? How can we inject things? That's where this feature, which was introduced in Visual Studio 2005, is very good. Partial classes and partial methods. We can then, having another file, so this is a scaffold. This is something we generate from the view model, which is the same for everything. But then we want to inject specific view, uh, business logic. Then we define them in an extension file. So in my case, let's see now here. On my order row, when quantity is changed, I need to recompute the amount on the parent order. When the order rows has a, a change, we need to recompute the total amount. That is a kind of business logic I want to inject into my mod, uh, into my into the general view model. It might not make sense in the view model, but it doesn't matter. That's not the important thing here. So here I have a partial method saying, well, once I have a partial class here, which means that when the compiler compiles uh, order of class in the generator code and order of class here, they merge it. So we can inject properties, we can inject methods, but in order to inject behaviors, we have injection points in the generator view model. So we have an on-change quantity, which is triggered whenever the quantity is changed. If they ever use light switch, they use a similar technique. And Visual Studio is nice in that it finds all these for us, which we can sort of, uh, all the partial methods we have, with, and we can sort of implement it quite easily. If you want to think of it as something, as something similar, it's like events, but at compile time. And let's just run this very quickly and see if I can make it work. So I want to make sure that this, when I, this, uh, let's see here. When this quantity is changed, the quantity is now two. I hope you can see that. I want to change it to one. I now want to sort of confirm that my business log logic is triggered and it does the recom recomputation. So the way I do it here is just I put a breakpoint in my view model extension on change quantity, this is where the place it should hit. And I got a hit here, so it, it, I change it, um, I change it here. It goes through the generated code, which triggers the, uh, the partial method on change quantity, which then calls recompute amount, which then recomputes it. And I'm going to put the breakpoint here. And, and it then we have then recomputed the total amount. So that's a way to sort of inject behaviors into generated code, which is very useful, I find. Let's stop this example. I, uh, if you wonder why I'm sort of fumbling with my keyboard, is that I forgot to turn on the light, and I don't want to meddle with that when you are in a pres presentation, so I'm sorry for that. Let's go back to the presentation. So generating view model classes is one way to do it, but there are many other cases. You can sort of use T4 and these kind of tools as well to sort of you know, help avoiding to maintain redundant code. I think T4 is powerful 
because it can solve a big class of problems. I used it for, uh, from anything from C sharp, F sharp, C, serialization code, view models, dependency properties. Uh, I uh, have generated 300,000 lines of TSQL code once. I'm very happy I didn't have to write them. Um, it was very, very good. Five months it would have taken. I think it's a simple concept. I think most developers are able to understand it. Not my mother, but she's not a developer. Also, th this is also language agnostic, in that it, we can use it to generate C-sharp, XML, poetry. It doesn't really matter from the point of T4. There is an access strategy, and by this, I, I, I mentioned this earlier, my team, where they had to throw away all my code, had no access strategy except throwing away all my code. Nothing could be salvaged. It was very sad. Here, if I use T4, a similar, similar tool, to generate code, what I'm basically is replacing is the activity of typing the code. Well, if a team says we don't understand PHP, we cannot understand the concept of PHP or ASP, well, stop using it then and start maintaining the code which is generated. I think that's the wrong way to do it, but it's your choice, guys. You can stop using it immediately, and that means there's a good access strategy, and that means there's less risk of introducing things like this, because if I'm about to introduce something at Ericsson, which there is no exit strategy in, which affects all the team for all the future. I have to involve my boss, my boss's boss, my boss's boss's boss, the product guardians, the techno technological management team, and sort of convince them. In the end, they kind of come up with the conclusion, no, I'm not allowed to do it. If there's an exit strategy, I just basically have to talk to the team and my boss and say, it's basically automating writing code. We can stop using it whenever. It's not a big decision. The yellow one here is lightweight. Because if you're using Visual Studio, it's kind of lightweight. It's there. You might like to use the tangible engineering add-on, but it's not really necessary. But if you're like me, working on a Linux environment currently, and like the concept of T4, I, there's no really good way to sort of you know, deploy it or build machines. I don't want to force the mono development environment just to get T4. And now I'm going to check the watch again to see how much time I have to do. Uh, when do I have to stop? Do you know that? Five minutes now. Don't I get a little bit extra from the hassle with the microphone? Maybe I shouldn't talk too much. Um, if I have five minutes, I don't think I can talk too much about Carnelian. I will just mention it. Okay, eight. I will mention it. So Carnelian is like T4, but in Ruby. So this is a T4 example, right? If I want to generate this kind of code at Ericsson when I don't have Visual Studio, uh, I might write the Carnelian program which is a Ruby gem, if you have a Ruby installed on your machines, which we have at Ericsson, and it's not a very big, uh, big uh, environment anyway, uh, you can install gem install Carnelian. And I can write code like this. The big difference is that the, it uses this tag to start each line, and it has a little bit different tag to sort of inject it. And we can sort of, you know, and the, here's Ruby code. Other than that, it's very similar. So T4 isn't really the important thing. I think the important thing is uh, the way to do this, the way to sort of write code, meet the programming. So, uh, yeah, I had a demo, but I have to skip that. And Canela sh have this shares the same properties as T4, except it's also kind of lightweight. I can run it from a command line. I don't have to run it from inside maybe Visual Studio. I had a long list of good advice I want to give you when you get started, but then I s uh, took my own advice and started small. I think the important thing is when you're going to start with T4 is find a small problem that irritates you, that you can't really get to, and solve that. Don't try, it might be very tempted to solve all the world's problems, and then you probably fail because you're inside a new domain and it's get a little bit awkward. Start small and grow from there. I think that's the best advice for anything, really. I also demonstrate a little bit of code, but honestly, this is what is real. This is, if you understand this code here, if you can understand this concept, you already understand T4. If you understand ASP, you understand T4, except it's not HTML here. It's just anything. This is what it's all about. So even though it sometimes can get complicated, my view model code might go got a little bit complicated, this is it, really. Sometimes get more complicated because it's more complicated, but it's fundamentally simple, I think. But can something that simple be useful? To me, it really saved me, because you remember, I struggled. How can I write code which is maintainable, which is not, I don't have to maintain the duplicated code, but still get invited to lunch? Lunch is important here in Sweden, so I want to do that. 
Well, I tried many different techniques and I found the best one to be T4. And some might say to me, well, you know, T4, I think it's inelegant. I think it's clunky. And I say to these guys, yeah, you're right about that. It is not a very elegant solution, but it's an effective solution that most people can work with. I watch my teammates working with, you know, Canelian in our case then, and I, when people work with T4, they can make changes to this generated code and be productive. And I think that's because it supports these kind of, you know, incremental steps. Where you make a little bit of change, you run this, the generator, you look at the code that's being generated, which is normal c -sharp code, which is not uh, EL code or the expression trees or anything. It's normal c -sharp code, and you say, it's almost there, but not right. And then they fix it, and they have these small iteration loops. And because we are not sort of, you know, uh, trying to avoid, uh, because we're not maintaining the generated code, we can also afford generating simple code. So when we do debugging code, it's not a dynamic IL, it's simple, straightforward code almost anyone can understand. And uh, like I mentioned, it saved me a lot of time. At least six months of writing TSQL 300,000 lines got, <laughs> I say, by writing one quite complicated T4 engine for that. But in the end, I think it was a huge win. So to wrapping up, I think T4 and Canelian. I work at Ericsson with Java 1.4. I don't say that Java is a bad language, because it's not. But Java 1.4 is old, and I don't have generics. T4 allows me to work and pr deliver good solutions with old tools, and sometimes bad tools, which Java isn't. And I think it transformed the way I'm thinking. I think the, the way for re to reach a full potential as developers is not to just be a programmer, but to be a meta programmer. Become what you are. So I guess that's my ending line. And if you have any questions of this, of course, uh, free to uh, contact me on Twitter. And uh, if you have any questions and want to sort of get started, free 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 feel free to ask me anything. Um, this is important, I think. Anyway, uh, on the way out, please vote. Uh, oh, the green one is the best. <laughs> so, 